In the last two seasons, we've looked into the boyhood of a famous lawyer from Iowa, a dramatist from California, and an old sailor from the eastern shore of Maryland. And today we come to the fourth in the series, the boyhood of Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick, one of the most courageous preachers of his time. Incidentally, 20 years ago, any Sunday afternoon, you'd have been tuning into his radio program just about now. So let's go to the place from where his voice went to many more people than ever got inside to hear him. This is one of the landmarks of New York City, the Riverside Church overlooking the Hudson, which for 20 years through the 1930s and 40s broadcast to millions of Americans the voice of its pastor, Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick. The basic reason why men and women lie down on life instead of standing up to it is that within themselves, they run out of power. The ability to stand up and take it is a power question. And power is not something we get merely by blowing on our hands and willing it but by opening ourselves inwardly to spiritual resources greater than our own. Today, Dr. Fosdick is retired in his 77th year, and you can find him where I found him at the end of the summer, running his own boat along the coast of Maine. Here, we're coming in across Booth Bay Harbor to his home and family on Mouse Island. The boy tying up the boat is his grandson, Steve. It was a gray day, as you see, when I went to call on him, but that didn't prevent his showing me with pride this rocky point on which some years ago he built his study. And uh, now we're on Mouse Island. Mouse Island. Mouse Island, about 16 acres. Two of us live here. We've been living here in the summertime for over 30 years. Well, do you feel oriented? Absolutely. Set. Are you ready for the ordeal? Ready for the ordeal. Oh, I well, that's good. Thanks. Where I've done a lot of my work. Nice isolated spot where I get off by myself and think. And can we talk frankly in that case? Absolutely. Well, Dr. Fosdick, we want to find out something about your boyhood, what kind of an American you are, where you come from, the forces that made you, what made you decide to do the work that you did during your life. Now, would you begin and tell us where you were born and well, when? I was born in Buffalo, New York on May 24th, 1878. May 24th, Queen Victoria's birthday. And I used to go across the river into Canada and let the Canadians celebrate my birthday by shooting off firecrackers for the Queen. <laughs> Uh, was there any historical event around the time of your birth that would help us to focus this period? Oh, well, I'm getting to be an old man, and I am impressed by the fact when I remember that visiting uh, Thomas Edison once in his laboratory in Jersey, I had it impressed on me that uh, he had uh, invented the phonograph the year before I was born, and the incandescent electric light the year after. Dr. Fosdick, in 1878, the year of your birth, about how many people were there in the United States, do you know? About 50 million. That's a third of what there are today. Yes, and 40 million of those were living in uh, great open spaces, mainly on farms or in villages with less than 4,000 population. Now, as a boy, uh, I'd like to get your daily routine. The kind of breakfast you had? What <coughs> you had? Well, the chief difference in breakfast was that we had big breakfast. That was a hangover. Yeah, yeah, we had no orange juice and we had no dry cereal. We started in with things like hot cereal and fried eggs and then pancakes with molasses on them. My record is 14 pancakes at a breakfast. Did you recover from that? I recovered and lived to tell the story. <laughs> Dr. Fosdick, in those days, how, what did you do about organized games? Never had any organized games in those days. It was all done by the boys themselves. And uh, our life centered in the game. 
That has a very menacing sound. To well, it wasn't menacing then. We had a great gang. There were six boys in it, and they all turned out well. <clears throat> well, now, this gang interests me because of uh, people thinking today that the gang itself is a bad thing. Uh, what did the gang do? How did you uh, go about uh, filling your time? Well, we really were a, a very constructive uh, group of youngsters. For one thing, we built a shanty. Down by Plum Bottom Creek, we built it ourselves. We built bunks with the barrel staves uh, sloped under so that we could sleep on them. And uh, did your parents uh, mind us? Presumably oh, no. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, no. They backed us up. And uh, uh, there was no, there's no plushy boys club in history that ever gave more satisfaction to its members than that little shanty that we built with our own hands. And, uh, of course, there were rival gangs, too. On Halloween, we had bonfires and strung strings across the street to knock people's hats off when they walked and rang doorbells. And on the night before the 4th of July, we, we tolled the, uh, the church bells at midnight. And then there was a rival gang, I recall, that uh, threatened to get ahead of us in ringing the bells on the night before the 4th of July. So we did them one better by stealing the clappers out of all the church bells in Lancaster. Uh, the, clap, the clapper of the Methodist church bell was under my bed for a week before it was found. Would you like to tell us what sort of a home your mother and father provided for you and their ideas about bringing up children? Difficult to put into a few words. I had a wonderful father and mother. If I had a chance to live over again, could choose father and mother, I'd choose them. One of the great things they did for us was uh, to give us a democratic home. When I hear a lot of these new ideas uh, about uh, bringing up children discussed, I wonder why they call them new. Because my father and mother brought us up to be independent citizens of the home. Now, when you say democratic, Dr. Bostic, what... Uh, what well, I mean that when we had some family problem, and we had uh, financial problems, for example, instead of having a dictator hand down a decision, there was a family council. And uh, I can remember them all my life long back there. And uh, we children were called in, we were asked our opinions, and our opinions were treated with respect, and we felt one of a very tightly coordinated group. There was a sort of a fierce tribal loyalty in our home. Did your uh, father, <coughs> however, ever enjoy the uh, privilege of a benevolent dictator about the chores around the house? Oh, sure, in his own way. Once he was starting out for school, and uh, my mother was waving goodbye to him on the front stoop. That's what we called it then. And uh, my father said, tell Harry he can cut the grass today if he feels like it. And then he took two or three steps and he turned around and he said, tell Harry he had better feel like it. <laughs> well, now, uh, he had uh, that form of uh, sovereign control, but uh, he was primarily a companion and a chum, as my mother was too. <laughs> Thank you.